that they want to start looking at how to use methods in our programs and do a more modularized approach to programming. We've utilized methods in some of our statements, such as the focus method and the clear method. We've also been working with sub-procedures, in particular event procedures, that handle some event. All of our code thus far has been inside uh, event procedures. And here's the format for an event procedure in Visual Basic. We have an optional um, accessibility keyword which to date has pretty much always been private. Um, there is a public keyword and a few others as well. And then you'll see the word sub there, which tells me this is a sub procedure. It's a group of code that does something. When we double click on an object, it creates a procedure name for us to handle some event. And that procedure name is usually the name of the object, an underscore, and the event that's being handled. So in the code above here, we have btn calc underscore click as our procedure name. And then we've seen that there's some things inside parentheses that to date we've pretty much ignored, and those are all called parameters. That gives me some information about the object and the event that triggered this code. And then we've seen that we can handle different events, and I can separate events and multiple events by separating them with a comma. So we have the handles keyword, and then the events are listed in terms of object, dot, and the event. Then we have some code that does something when that event is triggered and uh, is completed with an end sub statement. Let's take a closer look at the parameters that are in between the parentheses of an event procedure. There are two parameters here, and they are separated by a comma. We call that being comma delimited. Each parameter here has a keyword expressing how the data is passed between the calling statement and this event procedure. And you'll see the word by val there. The other option is by ref or by reference. So it stands for by value or by reference. We'll look at that a little more closely in the next video. And then we have a variable name. In this case, I have sender and I also have one called e. And then it is declared as some type of data type or class instance. So by val sender as system object. You can sort of think of this as very similar to our dim statement when we were creating variables and replacing the word dim with by val or by ref. Instead of just having a data type, we're now going into different types of classes or class instances. E is a type system.eventargs, or as an instance of the eventargs class. Those two variables, sender and e, can be used to get information about the object and about the event itself. So in this piece of code, I have sender and e, and it's handling three different button clicks here. I've got three different buttons in my application, button one, button two, button three, and the same piece of code is handling all three of those. But I can use sender to determine which button the user clicked on, and I can use e to determine uh, where they clicked within each button. Now, event args does not have any information in terms of the x and y coordinates where the user clicked. But there is a mouse event args, which is a subclass of event args that does have that information. So what I have here is a line of code that where I'm declaring another variable as type mouse event args, or as an instance of that, and I'm assigning the value of e to it. Because I know that basically the interaction that's causing these buttons, causing this code to trigger, is all mouse-based. And so I can convert e into a more stringent subclass of mouse event args and get a little more information. Then all I'm doing is showing which button they click by using sender.name and then the location I'm using ebt.x and ebt.y. And you can see there are the four different uh, message boxes that came up when I tested this. Um, so it's showing the name of the button, button one, button two, button three, and the location. And the location is the coordinates within the object itself. So if I were to click in the upper left hand corner of button one, that'd be zero, zero, rather than the coordinates of the application.
So that's how we could use those two parameters in terms of getting more information uh, about the event that was triggered. Here's another example. I have a picture box that has an image, and that image is divided into four quadrants, and I've colored them blue, red, yellow, and green. And here, once again, I'm using the variable e, which is of system.eventargs. You'll notice there's no by val in front of these here. That's actually optional. Um, I'm going to, again, cast e into being a mouse event. Then I'm going to get the x-coordinate. If it's greater than 100, which means that it's going to be past this mark here, this halfway mark on my image. I'm going to determine then where the Y coordinate is. Again, 100 is going to be the vertical center. And if they clicked where X and Y is both greater than 100, that means they clicked the green square. If they clicked where X is greater than 100 and Y is not, they clicked the red square. Otherwise, if the value of X is less than 100, it's going to mean they clicked on this side of that horizontal half mark. And then determining the value of y would determine whether they clicked on the yellow or the blue square. And you can see there the different message boxes that came up when I tested it. Well, now we're going to branch into creating our own sub procedures and functions that are not tied to an event. And in Visual Basic, we have two types of methods. Method is sort of the, the broad umbrella uh, category for subprocedures and functions. And the difference between the two is a subprocedure does something and a function returns some value. So a subprocedure does not return a value, but a function does. And they both will have code that does something, but the goal in the function is to determine the value that's being returned. They're coded very similarly. A subprocedure has the keyword sub in it. A function has the keyword function in it. They both have accessibility keywords, which could be private or public, and those are optional in VB. If it's not declared, it's considered to be private. We're going to give it a subprocedure name or a function name, and then we have inside parentheses parameters that are optional, where we can pass it information. And here's the big difference in terms of a function. It's going to conclude with as and some return data type, just like we did in the variables as holding some data type. We're going to declare our functions as returning a specific data type. It might be an integer, it might be a string, it might be single, it might be float, it might be boolean. It could even be a type of object. So let's take a little closer look at the subprocedure. So here's three examples of the declaration statement. So in the first one, I have nothing in the in the parentheses as far as parameters. So simply private sub south mountain and uh, we use what's called Pascal casing in declaring subprocedures and functions, and then I capitalize the first letter. Um, the second example here is a subprocedure that doesn't have an accessibility keyword. So by default, it's going to be private, but it doesn't have to be declared. And so I have sub, my cool visual basic procedure is the name, and then I'm passing it a value that's going to be a string value that will go into the variable xyz. And you'll see that I use XYZ in my code. The third example here is public sub another method. And here's going to be receiving two parameters. I'm going to pass it two arguments. The first one's going to be an integer. It's going to go into this variable called DEF. And the second one is the of type double called ABC. And I'm passing it by reference. And we'll look at the next video what that really means. I'm going to use those values in some calculation, and I'm going to show a message box. So nothing being returned in these, but we are doing something, in some cases making changes to um, maybe a control. Here I've got text of an, a label changing, or in the first and third one, we're showing a message box. So since these don't have event triggers, how do we get this code to execute? Well, we do that by calling it from another procedure. So here I have a event procedure named btn demo underscore click. It's handling the click event of my button btn demo. And inside that code, I have references to these three sub procedures. So my first line is South Mountain, and it has a pair of parentheses, which tells me it's a method. And it's going to go out to my code and find the method named South Mountain. It's a sub procedure, and it's going to 
basically execute this message box. When the user has interacted with the message box, control of the code is going to return back to the statement following that subprocedure call. By the way, in BB, we could also say call South Mountain. The next line of code, I'm going to have a variable of my string, which is a string type, equals South Mountain Community College. And then I'm going to call this, this sub method or sub procedure called my cool visual basic procedure. I'm going to pass it the value of my string. And the value of my string is South Mountain Community College. So it goes out and it finds my cool visual basic procedure uh, subroutine or sub procedure. And the value that I pass it of my string goes into this variable XYZ. So XYZ now equals South Mountain Community College. And I've got a couple of variables I'm declaring here. I is an integer, new string is string, which is null. And then I've got a loop where I'm going from the length of XYZ, however many characters there are in South Mountain Community College, minus one. So if we start indexes with zero, I'm going to do a minus one. And I'm going to go to zero and I'm going to step down by a negative one. And each time through the loop, I'm going to add or concatenate to new string the character that is at location i. But I'm starting at the back of the string. And so what's going to happen is I concatenate and this loop executes how many times it needs to go through all the characters. I'm going to get a value that's going to be placed into my LBL output label into the text property. And you can see it here. In essence, what it did was it reversed the text. Once that is done, then it's going to continue executing in my event procedure, and we'd have dim x equals integer as integer equals 5, dim y is double is 3.14, and I'm going to call another method, and I'm going to pass it x and y, so x is 5, y is 3.14, and it goes out and finds another method, and def takes on the value of x. Whatever's in the first position gets transferred in the first position here, and it's important that the data types are the same. It's expecting an integer. X is an integer. The second one, ABC, is of type double, and so is Y. So I'm passing it a double value. And then ABC equals DEF times ABC, and I have a message box that's going to show that. So 5 times 3.14 is 15.7, and that's what the message box shows. Once the user has interacted with that message box, hit the end sub, and it comes back to our calling procedure, and there's no more code, so basically it stops at that point. So think of sub-procedures and functions as well as simply detouring from your code to go out and do something and come back. So here's an example of a function. My accessibility keyword in these two examples is private. We have our keyword function. And then I have two function names, twice the fun and get product in twice the fun. It's receiving an integer value into a variable called XYZ. And it's going to return an integer type. And you'll see that there is a return value here where I'm returning XYZ after I've doubled it. That's what this little function does. It simply doubles the number that's passed to it and sends it back. In this other example, get product, I'm passing it two values. It's going to receive a value called i as an integer and j as an integer. It's going to return a string, though. Calculate the value of k, which is an integer variable, as i times j. And I'm going to return it k, but I'm going to return it the return a string value of k. So it's k.toString. So my return value has to match up with whatever I've declared in my declaration as the return data type. So the way this would be called, again from another procedure, in this case an event procedure, is I have x, y, and z. x and y are integers. I have values 2 and 5 placed in them respectively. X is going to equal, and I'm going to look for the function named twice the fun. Go find that. I'm going to pass it the value of X, which is 2. 2 goes into XYZ. I'm going to multiply that by 2, because XYZ equals XYZ times 2. And I'm going to return then the value of 4 back in twice the fun, back into this calling statement. So X now equals 4. Z, I'm going to get the product. I'm going to pass it X. X is going to go into the value of i, which is 4, so i is 4. J is going to take on the value of y, which is 5, so I have i is 4, j is 5. I've got a variable k of type integer. 
and k equals i times j, or 4 times 5, that's going to be 20. And it's going to return the value of 20, but it's going to return it as a string. And so then in my message box, I'm displaying the value of z is, and I'm showing the value of z. And I don't have to use a two string here because it's already the string data type. So again, it's important that our return data type match what's actually being returned. There's a little gotcha with functions. You need to make sure that every terminating path has a return value. So in this example here, I've got a function with a select case in it. And you'll notice that Visual Basic gives me a warning. It doesn't give me an error. It gives me a warning in that if x is not 1, 2, 3, or 4, let's say x is 6, nothing's going to be returned because it's not going to hit any case that it matches. And that would cause my system to crash. Here's how we fix it. I'm going to add a case else. So if it's anything but 1, 2, 3, or 4, I'm going to return a null string. And now every terminating case in that function, every path in that function that ends, has a return value. So the warning would go away. So why would we use subprocedures and functions? Well, it modularizes the code. And that's to a huge advantage for us in that we can reuse blocks in multiple methods without duplicating them. Maybe I want to have several methods or several event procedures in my program utilize the same block of code. And rather than having to copy and paste that code, which could be hundreds of lines long, I can save a lot of time by simply having it as a block that I can reference and utilize. Our sub-procedures and functions are also standalone, and then I can pull those out and use them in other programs. So that little function we just had to double something I might use in another application. It makes it easier to read the code. You've got smaller pieces to read, a little less to keep track of, and thus it also makes it easier to debug. By having things in smaller code snippets, it does make it more readable and easier to digest. It's ideal for a team environment because different team members or different groups can be working on different sub-procedures and different functions, and this is just a matter of summing them together and having things work. And it's an essential aspect in object-oriented programming. Like I said, we've been using methods in our programming already that are defined for us within the different objects that are part of Visual Studio and, and Visual Basic. We've used the clear method to clear the items of a list box. We've used the hide and show method, hide and show objects. We've used the focus method to give an item the focus. All of these things provide for something in object oriented programming called encapsulation, which helps us protect data. And so when I'm putting the, the text value of a text box into a variable, I'm actually accessing a method called a getter method of the text box class that returns the text. I can't access the text value directly. I'm accessing as a property of the class. And that helps protect data. So those are the reasons why subprocedures and functions become very important.